His pioneering, pioneering work has been the introduction of the stool transplant for severe alcohol-associated hepatitis. The, the, that was the world's first fluid resuscitation randomized control trial for septic shock in cirrhosis and multi, multiple seminal work on toxicology and chemical analysis of Ayush liver, liver injury. He has been the recipient of three time, three time recipient of the American Association for the Study of Liver Diseases, that is AASLD Clinical Hepatology Plenary Award for the years of 2015, 17, and 2021. He is also he has also received the ASLD Young Investigator Award uh, four times for the years 2015, 16, 17, and 2021, and he is the only hepatologist in the whole Asian continent to have done so. He is the International Young Investigator Award uh, recipient for, by the ASLD for the year of 2021 for his work on the long-term outcomes associated with the uh, uh, with the uh, FMT in severe alcohol-associated hepatitis. And for the same work, he also received the Om Prakash Rising Stored Star National Award by the Indian Society of Western Neurology. He is also he has also received the ASLD Award uh, for the inter uh, uh, for, inter for the International Fellow Award for his work presented at the Digestive Diseases Week, San Francisco, uh, San Diego, and Diego in 2022. He has more than 165 publications, uh, publications and more than 1,600 citations. He is currently a clinical advisor and doctoral advisory committee member to the Department of Cell and Tissue Culture, Sri Chitra uh, Thirunal Institute for the Medical Sciences and Technology, Department of India, at Trivendram, and expert member for the Center of Excellence in the Microbiome, microbiome for the State of Government of Kerala, India. Welcome, Dr. Siriak, and thank you for joining us. We, have, we also have a stellar panel of uh, the five uh, uh, great uh, panelists. Dr. Amrish Sahani is a senior consultant uh, in, the, uh, in transplant, transplant hepatology and, and uh, gastroenterology at the, Depart at the Department of uh, Hepatology and Liver Transplantation at BLK Max Hospital, New Delhi. He deals with all kinds of complicated and uncomplicated portal hypertension patients and is a leading endoscopic inter interventionist. He is a well-published and well-read hepatologist and has been very active in, in the field of academics as well. He is involved in the teaching of super speciality trainees at the hospital and has been the spearhead of the liver transplant program at the BLK Max Hospital. Welcome, Dr. Amrish. Dr. Saista Amin is a trained pediatric gastroenterologist and hepatologist from the King's College, uh, London. And he, she has also received training at the Sick Kids Tor uh, Toronto. And she is currently working at the Ministry Hospital in, the, in UAE. She has won the Young, Young Investigator Award in 2014 at ILTS. She has also earned FRCPCH title in 2020. She has many poster presentations and publications in the reputed journal. With extensive experience in pediatric liver transplant, uh, she has been featured in many leading newspapers in India as well as abroad for her work. Welcome, Dr. Saista. Dr. Amar Mukund is a senior interventional radiologist who is heading the department of one of the topmost liver uh, institutes in India, that is the Institute of Liver and Biliary Sciences. He is well known for his interventional radiology work, and he is one of the topmost interventional radiologists in the whole in the entire country. He has been uh, uh, he has been uh, not just doing but uh, but teaching as well a lot of DM students and uh, there are a lot of students all around the country who have been doing marvelous work because of the teachings that he has uh, he has given. He also has a lot of publications and a lot of academic achievements and he is it is an honor to have him in our uh, pan uh, panel for today. Welcome, Dr. Amar. Dr. Ravi Bharadwaj is a senior pediatric hepatologist. Uh, uh, from uh, uh, who is working both at the Care Hospital Jaipur, India, as well as the BLK Max Hospital, New Delhi, India. He is dealing with uh, with uh, all kinds of pediatric uh, liver diseases patients as well as pediatric gastroenterology patients. He is spearheading the program of pediatric gastroenterology and hepatology at the BLK Max Hospital. He is not just an educator as well as the as well as a physician, but he's also a great researcher. And his work has been published all around the world and has been being the result, uh, uh, result for the lot of uh, pediatric hepatology uh, protocols which have been made around the country. Doctors, Dr. Jones, uh, Shaji Matthews, uh, it is an honor to have him because he is also one of our team members and uh, he has uh, been uh, uh, a big help to arrange this session uh, which we are having today. Dr. Jones is a, uh, clinical, is a clinical lead and the senior consultant of uh, liver transplant and HPV surgery. At, uh, the, at the Liver Institute in, the, in Kerala. He is one of the senior surgeons who is well 
trained in liver both adult as well as liver and as well as pediatric liver transplants and he has an achievement of hundreds of liver transplants uh, under his sleeve he is also an expert in doing the non transplant shunt surgeries and other surgeries which are done for the for the portal hypertension and it's he is going to be a great a great uh, addition for today's session to discuss the surgical aspect of the portal hypertension i welcome all of the panelists for today and uh, i'll uh, uh, invite dr siriak to dr uh, siriak abi philips to start the session from his side yes uh, thank you uh, dr sarab for that uh, introduction so without any further delay i'll uh, start sharing my screen and we'll move on to the uh, topic for to for the day okay, i hope uh, this is visible and i am audible yes you are thank you thank you no. yes okay uh, uh, thank you for inviting me to this session so uh, basically through this uh topic i would like to uh, discuss uh simple uh, aspects of portal hypertension management in our day to day clinical practice so i don't want to compl uh, complicate any uh, uh, any of the topic uh, to extend that you know people feel bored or you know they cannot use it in their clinical practice so we'll not be discussing any major basic science work or we'll not be discussing major papers what is current practice and what updates are there is what we will discuss in different aspects of portal hypertension so to start off with uh, this is a pathophysiology in a nutshell uh, i mean we all know that portal hypertension develops in a cirrhosis patients because of two factors one is the structural change that happens to the liver and second is the functional change functional change in the sense mostly it is because of the vascular related changes so the structural changes usually account for about 70% and the functional changes account for about 30% and structural changes include presence of inflammation fibrosis regenerative nodules presence of fat or even thrombosis and the vascular changes are mostly to do with uh, chemical receptors and hormones and other uh, other vasoconstrictors and vasodilator imbalances and all of this actually contribute to hepatic vascular resistance increase as as the disease progresses and that is what actually leads to portal hypertension so portal hypertension is a is a state of increased portal venous inflow because of structural and vascular changes within the cirrhotic liver and once that aggravates you will have different uh, clinical uh, manifestations of portal hypertension in the patient so how does portal hypertension spectrum move so we have a patient of cirrhosis recently diagnosed and he has evidence of portal hypertension i'll come to this in the next slides what evidence is we look for so we'll have a patient with portal hypertension which is either mild or clinically not significant uh, we'll have a patient with portal hypertension which is clinically significant in the presence or absence of varices and once the clinically significant portal hypertension uh, proceeds patients start developing complications of portal hypertension which results in decompensation of the underlying liver disease which later goes into an advanced or a late stage of decompensation where they'll have multiple uh, complications associated with portal hypertension or refractory complications whereby they either end up uh, having a liver transplant or they die in the natural progression of the disease so what are the stages so we we all know about discussing cirrhosis from a child point of view right we all talk about ctp a ctp b ctp c but i think we all should talk more on and discuss more on this particular aspect of classification of cirrhosis and portal hypertension which is based on the bavino staging so this was previously known as a de amigo staging and later it was endorsed by the bavino and this is how we actually stage so we'll have stage 1 to stage 5 and depending on the presence or absence of portal hypertension complications we have patients with varices uh, without varices in stage 1 with varices in stage 2 a bleeding event in stage 3 and a first non bleeding event in stage 4 and then in stage 5 you have patients who develop multiple complications of uh, cirrhosis and multiple decompensating event so this this particular diagram shows that the proportion of patients who actually move on from each stage into the other stages uh, within one year so for example if you look at a patient in stage 1 without varices the chance the proportion of patients who actually uh, die in that stage is only 1.5% that is in uh, in one year but if you look at a patient who has developed varicel bleeding then about 20% of them can die uh, within one year so by looking at this kind of uh, uh, representation of cirrhosis and portal hypertension we can easily uh, prognosticate our patients and take measures to uh, you know arrest progression of disease in particular stages 
or the defined patients who would improve with an early liver transplant. So this is what we should be practicing in our routine uh, clinical practice in hepatology. Don't go by uh, CTP ABC. Please try to go by the DMigo or the Bavino staging of liver cirrhosis and portal hypertension. So how do you approach a patient uh, with portal hypertension? So the first uh, aspect is to uh, define if the patient has underlying liver disease and if the liver disease is associated with a clinically significant portal hypertension. So we have me various measures to do it. We have invasive methods and we have non-invasive methods. So the non-invasive methods are mostly to do with imaging, uh, which includes both ultrasound imaging and contrast enhanced imaging, and also uh, something known as uh, liver stiffness measurement. That is, you, uh, you estimate the stiffness of the liver through a non-invasive method, such as an ultrasonographic shear wave method or a fibroscan method. I'll be talking about that in the next few slides. So once you identify patients who develop, uh, who have underlying liver disease, then you assess them for presence or evidence of portal hypertension. So that assessment can either be non-invasive in the form of imaging to look for collaterals or uh, using, using a fibro scan or a shear wave uh, to look for the cutoff limit of liver stiffness that will help us define patients who have clinically significant portal hypertension or use an invasive method like you know directly pressure uh, measure the uh, liver pressures, which is hepatic venous pressure gradient, which is a uh, angiographic procedure done in the cath lab, or do an endoscopy to look for variceal disease. So once you identify uh, chronic liver disease patients with uh, varices or presence of collaterals, they are the ones who have clinically significant portal hypertension. Or if the patient has an HVPG more than or equal to 10 millimeters of mercury, we define them as having clinically significant portal hypertension. Now, when you assess a patient non-invasively, and this is actually the most commonly used uh, tool in, the, in hepatology practice to non-invasively assess for presence of chronic liver disease, the stage of chronic liver disease, and also the presence or absence of portal hypertension. So this particular tool that is uh, liver stiffness measurement is actually is very commonly known as FibroScan. So FibroScan is actually a, a, a process which was, uh, which was a French invention. And uh, this was invented by this person by the name Laurent Sandrin. And uh, under the guidance of Professor Matthias Fink, uh, where they actually identified a particular, um, uh, they identified a particular technology known as vibration controlled transient elastography. They attended that in 1999. And two decades later, uh, two decades later, we have FibroScan. So FibroScan is the, is the name of the machine. The actual uh, procedure is known as vibration controlled transient elastography, where you uh, uh, use ultrasonic waves to measure the stiffness of the liver. So the more stiff the liver is, the more solid it feels like on the uh, test. And based on that, you, you, you get these uh, values uh, depending on the stiffness. So a normal liver would be somewhere around one to seven kilopascals, the stiffness. And as the stiffness increases, you'll have increment in kilopascal. So for each disease that you are assessing, for example, you're assessing an NAFLD related chronic liver disease, or you're assessing alcohol related chronic liver disease, for each of the disease, the cutoffs are different. So please be uh, aware of the cutoffs. Uh, you can actually see that these cutoffs are mentioned on the report. And please be aware that these cutoffs you should use in each patient separately and do not actually uh, you know, generalize a particular cutoff you know, above eight or about 10 as cirrhosis in everyone. It depends on the etiology of the liver disease also. So once you have identified a patient who has uh, chronic liver disease, uh, previously we used to have cirrhotic patients presenting with, you know, we defined them as either compensated or decompensated. And there is nothing uh, in between or beyond that. But things have changed. So according to the new Bavino guidelines, there is a group called as compensated advanced chronic liver disease, which is CACLD. And it is very important for us to define them because a subset of patients in this particular group, we can actually reverse their fibrosis, reverse their cirrhosis and bring them to a normal stage. So what is a CACLD? So look at this particular diagram on the right in the, in, in the red. You can actually say that when you, when you look at the clinical status, you'll, have, you'll see that these patients look non-cirrhotic. That is, they have no features of cirrhosis clinically. And, uh, but when you look at uh, histology, they will have F3 a minimum of F3 fibrosis, or in the uh, transient elastography, they will actually have a value between uh, somewhere around 10 plus, median of 15, but below 20. That is a liver stiffness is somewhere around 10 to 20. Uh, patients will not have clinical features of cirrhosis. And a biopsy, if you do, it will be a minimum of advanced fibrosis, that is F3. 
And in these patients, you have two stages. One is the early compensated stage and the late compensated stage. So early compensated stage, you actually don't have portal hypertension, which is significant. That is portal hypertension, uh, HUPG values will be less than 10. Uh, it'll, it'll be, uh, patients will not have areases or any collaterals. And as the disease progresses, when you have F4, that is cirrhosis, even then the uh, HUPG value will be less than 10. So a patient who, who is in between F3 to F4 without any clinical features of cirrhosis or with stable clinical features of cirrhosis, with a portal venous pressure, I mean, hepatic venous pressure gradient less than 10, or an elastography that is between 10 to uh, 20, a median of 15, we call them as compensated advanced chronic liver disease patients. And these patients are the ones we actually need to identify because we can actually halt progression uh, in, the, in this disease group, depending on the etiology. So uh, once you have a patient with portal hypertension that is recently diagnosed, I either have patients coming in with uh, an imaging finding showing that you know there is presence of varices or abdominal collaterals, or a patient who comes with a diagnosis of cirrhosis. That is, there is changes in the uh, liver structure and shape on imaging, and they have come to you for further evaluation and how we approach them. So first and foremost is to go for a physical examination, do the labs, that is the blood work, including C a complete blood count and minimum uh, liver function test. And you look at the synthetic dysfunction. So if the patient has a synthetic dysfunction, that is presence of jaundice or a low level of albumin, and the patient has a nodular liver and enlarged caudate lobe, then that is a cirrhotic patient. And if the patient has, then you look at assess the portal hypertension complications that the patient has, that is presence or absence of variasers and other things. Now, if the patient has no clear evidence of cirrhosis on baseline imaging, then you go for a liver stiffness measurement, that is either with fibroscan or a shear wave. So if that is above the threshold, then that is patient is diagnosed to have cirrhosis and with portal hypertension. I and mean, if it is below the threshold, then you can actually uh, go in for additional uh, imaging like MR imaging or uh, a biopsy. Now, if the patient is already diagnosed structurally on imaging as cirrhosis, always go for a liver stiffness measurement to confirm that this is advanced fibrosis or cirrhosis and also do a platelet count. Now, these two parameters are very important because if you have a patient with uh, a fibroscan less than 20 and a platelet count more than 1.5 lakhs, then in that patient, there is no clinically significant portal hypertension. You don't have to do a, a endoscopy in that patient. You don't need to do a CT scan in that patient. But if the patient has uh, liver stiffness more than 20 and platelet is less than 1.5, yes, this patient has possibly underlying clinically significant uh, portal hypertension, which means that this patient needs to be screened for uh, high-risk varices or presence of uh, significant varices. So always remember that when you see a cirrhosis patient in your clinical practice newly diagnosed, do not jump and go for an endoscopy right away and then go on to ban the varices right away. Please do, if available, a fibroscan and a platelet count. And if the fibroscan is more than 20 and platelet count is less than 1.5, then please do an endoscopy to see for varicel status and then treat the patient for the varicel disease. So uh, in the upcoming uh, say, I mean, uh, slides, we'll be discussing some important complications of portal hypertension from hepatic encephalopathy, uh, kidney involvement, pulmonary complications, ascites, and then varicell disease. So let us start off with the most important and most common one that we actually see in day-to-day -day practice, which is varices. So if you look at a cirrhotic patient, once you have a progression of cirrhosis and portal hypertension, various uh, collaterals start forming within the body. And the commonest site is the esophagus, followed by uh, the stomach. And the abdominal collaterals can form at any stage, even in the absence of uh, varicell disease. So once these, these are formed because of recanalization of embryonic channels, because of high portal pressures, or they can actually form because of neoangiogenesis. That is, new channels are formed in the presence of portal hypertension. And those channels are usually known as shunts. And we'll be coming to that uh, in a few slides later. So once the patient has uh, presence or absence of varices, you have to understand that if possible, if it is available in your, at your institute, this is not mandatory. If you can, please do an, a hepatic venous pressure gradient because this is important for us to prognosticate. So these are the new things that we can do for our patients with portal hypertension. So if a patient has more than a recall to 10 millimeter of mercury uh, HUPG, then that patient has clinically significant portal hypertension and requires treatment for portal hypertension. If it is more than or equal to 12, then there is an increased risk of variceal bleeding. More than 16 means there is increased risk of mortality at three years. And more than 20 means that in a bleeding patient or a patient who has high risk of bleeding, 
there is a very high chance of treatment failure due to uh, acute variceal bleeding, which remains uncontrolled. So these are the patients who will improve with early interventions. What interventions we'll be talking about in the next few slides. So this is the classification of esophageal varices. Uh, I think uh, there is no uh, generalized classification that everybody follows everywhere. I think it's very different in the institute I follow. It is different in the institute in Delhi. It will be different in uh, you know Pakistan or Bangladesh or in other parts of the world. So most importantly, what we have to know is that the previous classification of uh, measuring the varices, I mean, uh, for example, the uh, the tortuosity, the F grading, all the all these are now out. So what you have to do now is to just classify varices, esophageal varices, as small or large, based on a five millimeter cutoff. Five millimeter is used uh, to measure using the you know the biopsy forceps within the endoscope. And if the patient has a five millimeter less uh, size varices, that is known as a small varix, and more than five millimeters a large varix. Now, uh, at the bottom here, I've mentioned a few risk factors, that is high risk uh, factors on the varices for bleeding. So these are whale markings, these are hemocystic spots, these are diffuse whale markings, and uh, patients will have diffuse erythema over the varices also. So these are high risk uh, features where it shows that these varices can bleed. So you define varices as small or large with or without high risk features, that is low risk or Harris. This is how you define variceal disease at the moment, and it is easy for us to document also. So what happens when you identify varices? So when you screen patients with cirrhosis and there are no varices, then you have to repeat the uh, endoscopy in every, every two to three years. And if the patient has small varices and there is high risk of bleeding, then you start the patient on a beta blocker. That is a non-selective beta blocker. Currently advocated is carvedilone, and second is propanolone. Uh, if the patient has no high-risk varices, then you have to repeat the endoscopy in one to two years. But here I would like to mention that this particular aspect has changed. Even if the patient has low-risk varices, if the varices are present, even if it is low-risk or high-risk, you please treat that with non-selective beta blocker. Because current data says that if you treat a patient with uh, clinically significant portal hypertension, even in the presence of varices which are low or high-risk, it helps prevent decompensation in the future. So the moment you see varices, please treat the patient with a, a non-selective beta blocker. And obviously, if the patient has large varices, then you go on for a prophylactic therapy as always. So why do we repeat this? I mean, for example, you see these patients, we repeat up to one to two years, and these patients, we repeat two to three years. It depends on how the etiology is. So for example, if the patient is uh, a chronic alcohol user, and is continuing to take alcohol, they need screening at two years if they have no varices at baseline. Uh, if they have varices at baseline, you need screening at one year. But if these patients have well-controlled etiology, that is the liver disease is quiescent, it is not very active, they have stopped alcohol, they have lost weight, diabetes is under control, they are on antiviral therapy. If these things are there, then you can actually wait for three years in patients without varices to recheck their varicel status. And two years in patients who are already on beta blockers, um, uh, since baseline uh, evaluation. So please remember that you need to do endoscopy uh, from uh, anywhere from one to three years, depending on the etiology aspect of the patient and presence or absence of varices. Now, uh, how do we treat? This is primary, but this is primary prevention. So primary prevention is that when you find varices, you treat to prevent a bleed. Pre-primary prevention is to prevent the development of varices. So there is no recommendation to start beta blockers in patients without varices, even if they have clinically significant portal hypertension. So please remember, treating patients without varices just to prevent varices is not recommended, but treating patients with varices to prevent a variceal event is recommended. And you either use carvedilol, a maximum of 12.5 milligrams per day, or propanolol. Nadalol is not used in our, our part of the world. Uh, and you can actually choose what you want to use, even though carbidilol in the recent uh, papers have shown superiority over propanolol. But uh, ultimately, what you have to know, do is that you have to look at patient compliance and measure, may, ensure that these targets are maintained. That is, the systolic blood pressure is more than 90, and the resting heart rate is between 55 to 60. Depending on this, you can either titrate or reduce to uh, help the patient be compliant or tolerant. 
So previously, this was how we used to approach varices, right? The one in the gray column, you see large varices, you either put a beta blocker or you, you band ligate. And this, this practice is happening even now, where you actually see a large varix and you just band the patient and keep banding until the varices are eradicated, even if the patient has not bled. So this practice should stop. What we do is now what is seen in the blue column. So you assess the patient uh, with respect to the liver stiffness measurement and platelet count. And if the platelet count is low and liver stiffness measurement is more than or equal to more than 20, but less than 25, then there is clinically significant portal hypertension with varices. Then you directly start the patient on beta blockers. You know, even if, even if the varices are large or small, don't bother banding it. You don't need to band it in, in whatever stage the patient is. Even if the patient is in decompensated stage, don't band. Please start them on beta blockers. And once the patient is on beta blocker, if the patient is not tolerating beta blocker or there is contraindications to beta blocker, only then you go for band ligation. Otherwise, at the outset, please don't band all your patients with large viruses if they have not bled. So this is a, a, a few pictures where we show where I've shown uh, uh, you know how the varices bleed and what stigmata we find during endoscopy. So you can have anywhere from a large ulcer on the varix to a oozing varix to a white platelet plug to a red platelet plug, a ruptured varix here, a gushing varix here, and a spurting varix here. So these are all the uh, images that you see in a patient who is actually bleeding, a bleeding insulin varicel patient. This is what you see. Now, what do you do in a bleeding varicel patient? The first step is to do an endoscopy, and this has to be done within uh, 12 hours, and that is a dictum. Uh, you don't uh, take it beyond 12 hours. Even if you do it, even with, within six hours, it is equal to being uh, done in 12 hours. Only an exsanguinating patient where there is severe bleeding leading to hypotension and the patient is in shock, you have to stabilize the patient and then do the uh, varicel banding as early as possible. Banding is quite simple, very simple learning curve. Through an endoscope, we actually suck in the varix and then put a rubber band on top of it. So how many rubber bands do we apply? Ideally, it should be not more than six. Why? Why can't we put 10 rubber bands and 12 rubber bands? Because studies have shown that if you put anywhere above six rubber bands over in varicel disease, the outcome is same as doing it at 10, 10 rubber bands or putting 12 rubber bands. So the numbers don't matter. So anywhere between minimum of four to six, depending on the varicel columns, you can band the patient, but do not go beyond six. Uh, I've seen patients undergoing bands, uh, 10 to 12 bands have been put, and that actually inadvertently leads to post EVL ulcers and patients can have more bleed. So please don't band more than six. So this is how we approach a patient with uh, acute varicel bleeding, that is esophageal varicel bleeding. So initially you do a resuscitation, start them on vasoactive drugs, so the vasoactive drugs is shown here on the side. That is somatostatin or terlipressin or octreotide or vapriotide, whichever is available in your country or in your region, please use that. Because in variceal bleeding, for, for hemodynamic uh, stability uh, and control of bleed, any of them will do. Because studies have shown that the results with using any of this is equal. The only thing is that terlipressin additionally prevents kidney injury. So that is why terlipressin is currently endorsed as the number one agent for acute variceal bleeding. Even we use uh, terlipressin. Our guidelines also state terlipressin. But otherwise, if you don't have terlipressin, you can use the other ones because our, our aim is to stop the bleed and stabilize the patient. So once the patient comes with bleeding and the bleeding is controlled, so you assess the patient. So the patient might be in a low-risk group or a high-risk group. So the low-risk group is a patient with child A or B status without any active bleeding during endoscopy. He has a low MEL score that is below 19 and his hepatic venous pressure gradient, if you can measure it, please do, should be less than 20. So in such patients, we put them on vasoactive drug therapy, that is terlipressin or others for three to five days. And if there is no more bleeding, then you discharge and then you do secondary prophylaxis. That is, these patients are the ones who require repeated banding along with beta blockers to prevent a, a repeat episode of bleed. Now, if the patient has... Uh, uh, you know, if, if the patient actually has uh, early rebleeding, that is you start them on these drugs, uh, you do a band ligation uh, and the patient is fine. But then within the first five days, the patient bleeds again. Then you have to do a repeat endoscopy and see if you can uh, provide additional control through band ligation. If not, these patients should go for other modalities of treatment. So they will come in the high risk group. So the high risk group patients are or the, the persistent bleeding group. So the persistent bleeding group is the patient who actually has uh, failure to control bleed, 
or there is rebleeding during hospital stay within the first uh, five days. These are the patients who require either rescue tips procedure that is to directly reduce the portal hypertension or a procedure that can help us prevent uh, control that bleed that, like, such as balloon tabernate or putting a large esophageal metallic stent to prevent further bleeding. Now, the high-risk group is different. So this is the group that we should be worried about and careful about because we don't want the patient to land in persistent bleeding or failure to control bleed because that is going to be emergency tips and emergency tips always has a poor prognosis than a well-selected or a preemptive tips. So if a patient is child C between 10 to 14 points and with active bleeding and the meld is above 19 and you measure the HVPG which is more than 20, then these patients should directly go for tips. Please note this. You cannot keep doing endoscopies for these patients. If they have these risk factors, please, if, you, if your center has, an, uh, has a TIPS program, please go in for early TIPS for these patients because it improves the transplant-free survival as well as long and inter, uh, short and intermediate survival. So this is how you deal with acute esophageal varicell bleed. So this is the TIPS procedure. I mean, we have, uh, I'll just mention a little bit on it, but we have experts like Dr. Abhan Bukhanth sitting with us, who knows extensively on this and has done thousands of procedures. So basically in TIPS, what we do is we uh, make the high pressure system into a low pressure system, right? So for that, uh, we stent, we put in a stent, uh, a covered metallic stent uh, within, between the uh, right uh, branch of portal vein and the middle branch of hepatic vein. So that is what is shown here. And this is a transjugular procedure, which can be completed anywhere between 30 minutes to 60 minutes. And once this happens, you completely negate the effects of portal hypertension and patients will stop bleeding. So TIPS procedure is very helpful in carefully selected patients. And this is what you see on angiography. And this is how you actually make a tract through the hepatic vein to the portal vein and then place the stent uh, between the portal vein and the hepatic vein. Now, uh, certain groups actually place the stent between the uh, portal vein and the left hepatic vein also. What they say is that because the liver volume on the left side is lesser, placing a, a stent onto the left hepatic vein actually reduces chance of hepatic encephalopathy because the amount of blood going through here is lesser than the blood that has been transferred from the right lobe to the heart. So if, uh, I mean, we, we do this in very carefully selected patients and patients with uh, recurrent encephalopathy, we do a tips from right portal vein to left hepatic vein to reduce the hepatic encephalopathy episodes. This is not recommended. There are few case reports and CDs on it, but I think we need more data to actually routinely recommend this in tips practice. So two uh, statements that you need to understand is one is failure to control bleed and the other is failure of secondary prophylaxis. So if a patient has acute varicell bleeding less than five days and that uh, actually requires uh, blood transfusion or the patient develops shock or there is a new onset hematemesis or a new onset melina or a hematocrit drop below uh, you know 9% or hemoglobin drop of 3 gram, then you define the patient as having failure to control bleed. Now, if the patient has a re-bleed, that is an episode of bleeding after five days, then that is failure of secondary prophylaxis. So th these, two, uh, these two patients are tackled differently. If there is failure to control bleed, then you either go for tips or you go for the other options which I mentioned here. That is either SEMS placement or a balloon tamponade. Balloon tamponade is using a SEMS stick and bleed more tube very commonly. But there are some problems, pros and cons with it. One is you cannot place it for more than 24 hours. It is uncomfortable. It is through the oral or nasal route and you cannot do an endoscopy or feeding if the patient is on a tamponade and a lot of adverse events. But the, uh, the good part is that it is very cheap and easily available. The other one is a self-expanding metal stent, that is a Danisella esophageal stent, which can be used up to seven days. It is comfortable for the patient. It allows endoscopy and oral feeding even after you place it. But uh, the issue is that it is very expensive. So depending on how your patient can afford and how your, how your institute can uh, has the expertise, you can either put in a balloon tamponade or a metallic stenting if you don't have tips in your, in your, uh, in your institute. So in the absence of tips, these two are two extra options that you have for patients with either failure to control bleeding or failure of secondary prophylaxis. So this is basically the Sengstaken Blakemore tube. You have a Sengstaken Blakemore tube or a Minnesota tube or a Linton Nucleus tube. Sengstaken and Minnesota tubes are basically same, but the amount of air that can be pumped into the gastric balloon is more in the Minnesota tube. And the uh, Linton Nucleus tube actually does not have a, a esophageal balloon. It has only a gastric balloon. 
So you place the, uh, and you know, you place the whole apparatus through the mouth into the stomach, push in 50 ml of air through the prescribed channel, and then lock other channels and then put traction, pull it out and put traction on it. And that traction will actually uh, cause pressure at the gastroesophageal junction and then reduce the esophageal variceal bleeding. It does not improve portal hypertension, but it just prevents further bleeding until a definitive care can be taken up. So uh, what about the SENSE procedure? So this is basically the large esophageal stent that we place. So if this patient is actively ble bleeding, there is a gushing, you cannot actually put more bands because you can already see bands put here and there are ulcerations. So we place a, a, a self-expanding metal stent from the GE junction, like slight from covering the GE junction to the upper part of the esophagus. And you can actually see that the bleeding has stopped. And after seven days, you remove the stent. You don't keep it there. The problem is that if patient has large hiatus hernia, then this stent can actually migrate into the stomach. And that causes a lot of problem because then you can have sudden re-bleeding or a failure to control bleed even after the SEMS placement. So you have to be careful. Expertise should be required to place a stent like this. Now the TIPS procedure is what I would like to enforce here because if you can do it for the patient, if it is available, please do it because the TIPS is not just for the varices, it is for portal hypertension. And it is actually one of the best treatments that you can offer your patients if they are not an immediate candidate for liver transplantation and has severe complications of only portal hypertension. You can actually see that this patient has beautifully uh, recovered from complications and features of portal hypertension after TIPS placement. Next, we come to gastric varices. So gastric varices uh, is slightly more complex and difficult than esophageal varices because gastric varices is actually a complex uh, uh, complication. Uh, in the sense, gastric varices are associated with more of collaterals. There is a there is a there is a complex pathway. There is a, it has an afferent pathway and an efferent pathway. And also, gastric varices are usually what we call as associated with large portosystemic shunts. So this is something that we don't see in esophageal varices. But presence of large portosystemic shunts completely changes how we manage this variceal disease. So we have the uh, original serine classification. Uh, which uh, classifies into type 1, type 2, type and uh, GOV, or type 1 and type 2 IGV. But this classification is slowly coming uh, out of favor because we have better classifications which actually take uh, conscience of both the uh, anatomy, that is the shunt anatomy, and the various hemodynamics of these variuses for us to uh, give better targeted approach to treating variceal disease. So uh, this is, I've shown some examples below of uh, gastroesophageal varices type 1 and 2 and also uh, IgV1 and IgV2. So this is the shunt anatomy. I think everybody should know about this because gastric varices is not just gluing or uh, coiling. It is much more than that. So based on the anatomy, you, you can actually see there is a varix here and you have a supply from the left gastric vein or a short gastric vein or a posterior gastric vein. And then you can have large shunts also supplying the varix. So this actually makes the variceal disease a complicated anatomic structure. And based on that anatomy of drainage pathway, that is afferent or efferent, that is outflow pathway and inflow pathway, we can actually divide these into different types. That is type A, B, C or type 1, 2, 3. And depending on these types, we decide what treatment we need to offer. For example, if the patient has a large shunt and a big varix, you need to actually not tackle only the varix, you need to tackle the shunt also. But if the patient has no shunt, and has only a big variceal complex with small collaterals, then you can only tackle the varix. There is no need to go for a shunt or a portal hypertensive management separately. But if the patient has multiple collaterals, large shunts, and a large variceal complex, then you actually need to consider uh, doing additional procedures like tips or shunt occlusion in this patient. So this is the variceal, gastric variceal classification that we must follow. This is more comprehensive. It is also hemodynamic based and not just location based. So how do you prevent a primary uh, gastric variceal bleed? So just like esophageal varices, you assess for high or low risk. If the patient has uh, GOV1, that is uh, gastroesophageal varices type 1, you treat exactly like what, how we treated in esophageal varices. If the patient has gastroesophageal varices type 2, then what we do is we assess the variceal uh, risk. Small varices here is not 5 millimeter, it is actually 10 millimeter. So if the patient has less than 10 millimeter, it is four. If it is more than 10 millimeter, it is large. And if the patient has not bled, please put the patient on beta blockers. Now, what about very high risk varices? That is, patient has large varix, more than 20 millimeter. There is high MELT score, decompensated. In that case also, uh, we can actually put them on beta blockers 
to prevent further bleed if the patient has not bled. But a single randomized control study has shown that you can actually go in for preventive uh, measurement, uh, preventive measures like you know prevention of bleeding by go, uh, doing a prophylactic glue injection or a coiling. But this is not recommended as per the Bavino guidelines. This can happen if the physician and the patient wants to. Otherwise, it is not recommended. And if the patient has a large shunt associated with it, in the absence of uh, a bleed event, please don't occlude the shunt, which is why I have put a uh, red marker here, because uh, you don't primarily occlude a shunt because of a high-risk gastric varix. You only occlude the shunt if the patient has actually bled or if the patient has encephalopathy because of the shunt. So please don't primarily occlude a shunt or inject a varix if, you, uh, uh, if, if the patient has not bled. But depending on what the patient prefers and you prefer as a physician for the patient, if there is a high risk of bleeding, you may go ahead with the prophylactic gluing for these patients. So these are some pictures of massively bleeding uh, patients from our uh, experience. Uh, gastric varicose bleeding is always very difficult to control because it's in the stomach. And I, I'm sure a lot of the uh, endoscopists here know how difficult it is. So how do you uh, manage a patient with active gastric variceal bleeding? So uh, in here, we have uh, uh, two types of patients. One is a patient with a shunt, and one is a patient without a shunt. <clears throat> so let us look at gastroesophageal varix type 1, which is like esophageal varices only. You control the bleed, go in for variceal eradication, start the patient on beta blockers. And if the patient has a recurrent bleeding or a re-bleeding, you please uh, of the TIPS procedure as the uh, control measure for portal hypertension. This is very simple. If the patient has persistent bleeding, then you directly uh, look for TIPS procedures. High-risk patients who keep on bleeding, TIPS is the way to go. But what about uh, gastroesophageal varix type 2 or IgV1? So in these patients, if the bleeding is controlled, still you go ahead with various er eradication protocol that is gluing and uh, banding uh, along with beta blockers and then continue the uh, endoscopic uh, surveillance throughout the years. That is every two to three years. Now, if the patient has persistent bleeding, then you have to, 100% you have to look at the imaging. So every gastric variceal bleeding patient, please do a contrast imaging of the abdomen, that is a CT imaging, to look for the anatomy of the gastric variceal complex. You have to identify the afferent, the outflow, the inflow, and you have to identify presence or absence of shunts. So if there is prominent draining shunt, then you look at the portal vein. So the patient has a gastric variceal bleed, which is persistently bleeding. And the patient has, uh, oh no, in a, on the contrast imaging, has a large shunt. And then there is a portal vein, which is severely attenuated or thrombosed, or a portal vein, which is patent. Depending on that, you take a call. So if the portal vein is patent, and the patient has uh, no other complications of ascites or hydrothorax or other complications of portal hypertension, then you can actually go directly for shunt occlusion for these patients. You don't have to do a TIPS. But if the patient has uh, a severely attenuated portal vein and uh, these patients actually have encephalopathy at admission, then these patients need to be considered for uh, endoscopic procedure, that is endoscopic ultrasound. So if you have a thrombosis portal vein, and the patient is in active encephalopathy, consider endoscopic coiling of these varices and the collaterals that supply it. But if the patient has a shunt associated with it, then you can actually obliterate the shunt, block the shunt, and then do endoscopic coiling also. But if there is no active encephalopathy, then tips with shunt occlusion is the way to go. So you have patients with a, a, a patent portal vein, you can offer them only shunt embolization with variceal uh, obturation. If the patient has Encephalopathy with the uh, portal vein block or attenuated portal vein where TIPS is difficult, then these patients can be taken off for endoscopic ultrasound with or without shunt occlusion. And if the patient has no encephalopathy and you can actually technically do a TIPS in that small portal vein or can actually recanalize a portal vein, please go ahead with the TIPS with the shunt occlusion. Do not keep doing gluing for these patients. This is very important. There is no point in repeated glue sessions for gastric variceal bleed. Either tackle the shunt or go in for EUS and coiling of the collaterals and continue them on beta blockers or consider TIPS with a combination like shunt occlusion or um, uh, you know, coiling, etc. 
So the concept of shun demoralization is not new. It has been there for a while, but the acceptance of this in daily practice is quite new and people should actually know about it. As treating hepatologists, you should know about it. So you can actually have, see that there are various uh, collaterals that form in the body because of tension. And you can access these collateral pathways differently. So you have a trans umbilical, trans variceal, trans femoral, uh, trans hepatic or trans jugular way of uh, assessing or accessing the shunt by which you can actually either block the shunt or embolize the varix associated with the shunt. So if patients have massive ascites, you go for a trans jugular if it is possible or you drain the ascites and then you can go for a percutaneous trans hepatic either to block the shunt or to embolize the varix. Uh, this is some, these are some examples where I've shown, you know, patient has large bleeding gastric varices. There is blood in the stomach with the varix here. You, uh, you access through the percutaneous route, put a balloon in the shunt and then uh, inject sclerosant and then block the shunt. And you can see on follow-up, the, the uh, varices are all blocked. The sclerosant is here and all the varices, lipidiol is there and all the varices are gone. In this, uh, you can actually say that patients patient also had, uh, you know, uh, ascites. So we drained the ascites. And then what we did was we blocked the shunt. And you can actually see that once the shunt was blocked, then the patient actually had improvement in portal vein caliber and liver function tests. So what happens when you block a shunt is that all the blood inside the shunt will go back into the liver and you can have aggravation of portal hypertension. So in that case, if the patient has already ascites at, at, or at baseline when you're treating for barrier bleeding, ideally, if you're going to, going to go block the shunt, please consider a TIPS procedure along with it because TIPS will take care of the portal hypertension and any amount of blood flow in the liver, the TIPS will handle it. But if the patient has no ascites, you can directly only go for a shunt occlusion. And some of these patients do develop ascites in the future because of the shunt occlusion, but they can be easily managed through diuretic therapy and beta blocker therapy. Now I come to ectopic variceal bleeding. So any varices that has no continuation with the esophageal varices is actually considered ectopic. So you have GOV1, esophageal varices, and GOV1 and GOV2 are actually a standard classical varices. Anything beyond that, that is IGV1, IGV2, duodenal varices, stomal varices, jejunal varices, these are all uh, ectopic varices. So I'm, I have shown a, 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 a picture here, which we published recently. You can actually see that this patient is actually bleeding from umbilical varices, massive paraumbilical varices, which are spurting. What we did was we accessed the uh, shunt that is supplying that varix, and then we did a percutaneous, uh, uh, percutaneous embolization of the varix through the shunt and then obliterated the shunt without doing a tips here. So if you have an ectopic variceal bleeding, the first is to see if the varices are accept, accessible on endoscopic or colonoscopic uh, you know, uh, procedure. If they are accessible, then please do endoscopic management. That is, in, inject a glue or use a sclerosin to obliterate the varices. If there is no endoscopy or colonoscopy access, for example, varices like this, <clears throat> they are on the umbilicus or in the jejunum where you can we cannot access immediately. Then identify the varices and also understand their patho uh, the anatomy on cross-sectional imaging. And based on that, if the cross-sectional imaging is good for a TIPS procedure, please offer them a TIPS procedure. If the patient is having contraindications to TIPS, that is actively in encephalopathy, advanced liver failure, jaundice, encephalopathy, uh, sepsis, kidney injury, then, then these patients, you do not, do not do TIPS. What you can do is you uh, either through the transjugular route, through the liver, um, access the shunt or the varix and embolize it and then come out without putting a stent. That is known as transjugular intrahepatic variceal embolization. Or you access the shunt or the varix through the transhepatic route and then come out. So we, without putting a stent also, we can do the procedure of embolization and shunt occlusion in high-risk patients for TIPS. But if the patients are good for TIPS, please go ahead with the TIPS procedure. And also, ex especially patients who are having uncontrolled bleeding or re-bleeding from ectopic varices, they all should go for TIPS procedure. So remember these definitions with respect to acute bleeding. Uh, so we have uh, failure to control bleed and we have re-bleeding. So failure to control bleed is basically less than five days and re-bleed is more than five days. And depending on that, you choose uh, your intervention early or delayed. So failure to control bleed patients should go for early intervention in the form of TIPS procedure or endoscopic coiling for gastric varices, or um, uh, they should go for other, other uh, tamponade procedures or uh, like balloon tamponade and uh, SEMS placement. Now that we have discussed on portosystemic shunts and gastric varices, uh, please know that
there is a distinct complication of portal hypertension known as portosystemic shunt syndrome. So this is something that everybody should look for in their patients because this has a very distinct and different outcome when you compare with a cirrhotic patient, a run-of-the-mill cirrhotic patient that you see. So some patients actually have large portosystemic shunts. <clears throat> that is, they have large gastrorenal varices or linore uh, gastrorenal shunts or linorenal shunts or large mesocaval shunts. And these may or may, may not be associated with varices. And if they have these large shunts, that is the shunt is large when you define it above 8 millimeter of diameter. So a large shunt is defined as more than 8 to 10 millimeters of diameter. And in the presence of large shunts, patients can go through three distinct stages, irrespective of their child and male status. So in stage one, you have a large uh, shunt, but the patient has minimal HE and uh, may or may not have portal vein thrombosis, but the patient is usually stable. In stage two, these patients develop recurrent encephalopathy because of the shunt. And they have frequent en uh, encephalopathy and the liver parenchymal uh, decrement is also much uh, more in these patients. And they have sluggish portal flow because all the blood flow is going away from the portal vein into the shunt. And in stage three, these patients will have uh, persistent encephalopathy. They have features of hepatic Parkinsonism. That is, a chronically, uh, uh, chronic encephalopathy patients develop features of Parkinson's disease. And uh, these patients also will have ascites and jaundice and uh, presence of liver failure and portal vein thrombosis. So in stage one, this is known as Kumamoto grading, uh, Kumamoto classification, which is modified by SAG. And in stage one, you just need to wait and watch. In stage two, these patients will improve with shunt embolization. And in stage three, these patients require liver transplantation. So this is another classification of portosystemic shunt syndrome in a cirrhotic patient. Now, what about portal hypertensive gastropathy? So you can actually see that this is a very common finding when you do endoscopies. You can have this snake skin appearance, these small hyperpigmented uh, bleeding spots or oozing, diffuse oozing from these spots in patients who have with or without varices. This is known as portal hypertensive gastropathy. It can have also happen in the colon and it is known as colopathy. So basically, uh, these patients can present in two ways. One is a chronic bleeding or an acute bleeding. Chronic bleeding patients usually come with <laughs> iron deficiency. And uh, if they have iron deficiency anemia, please correct for the iron deficiency anemia and also start them on beta blockers. In the presence or absence of varices, this has to be treated. That is portal hypertensive gastropathy. And then you follow the same like you follow for esophageal varices. If the patient has acute bleeding, treat it like a varicel bleeding. So you target the hemoglobin 7 to 8, start them on antibiotics, and then start them on vasoactive agents, and then see if there is control of bleeding from the portal hypertensive gastropathy. Some patients will have refractory bleeding, that is, they have transfusion dependence. Even if you correct their uh, portal hypertension with beta blockers, they don't improve. So such patients actually can improve with a TIPS procedure because this is directly related to portal hypertension, not like GAVE. GAVE is totally different. That is gastric antral antral vascular ectasia, where you don't actually improve the patient by doing a TIPS. Uh, this is PHG. And uh, some patients, advanced liver, liver failure patients with PHG actually improve with uh, liver transplantation. So please consider that in patients with high MEL score or decompensated cirrhosis patients. So now we go on to ascites. So ascites is, I think, uh, the commonest what we uh, see in our patients in daily practice. So uh, first of all, please know how we uh, grade the ascites. And this is actually... Uh, the new uh, grading is actually in 2000 by the International Ascites Club, where you can actually have ascites <clears throat> notable only by USC, that is mild ascites. Then you have moderate ascites, where you can actually uh, find ascites using the shifting dullness technique. And then you have a large or uh, marked ascites, that is severe ascites, where there is a, a fluid trail. So this is how you grade ascites, and depending on the grade, you plan the management. So in grade one ascites, previously it was known as incipient ascites, but now it is known as grade one. You start them on a low dose of diuretic, and it has to be preferably uh, spironolactone. So once you start spironolactone, then there is good response. You maintain that therapy. You don't stop spironolactone. You actually uh, continue lowest dose of spironolactone that controls ascites. Maybe it is 25 milligrams per day. Maybe it is 12.5. But you continue that as long as uh, possible if patient is tolerating it. Now, if there is poor response and grade one actually worsens to grade two, then you add a loop diuretic, which is frosamide and uh, or torsamide. So once this is added, patients will have a good response. If patients don't have a good response, even with addition of uh, a loop diuretic, then you may consider adding torvaptan. 
So this is something new. And I have taken this from the Japanese guidelines. What, we, what they do is that if patients don't have good response to uh, loop diuretics with spironolactone, what they do is they actually add Torvaptan to increase free water clearance. And this actually improves uh, effectiveness of the diuretic therapy. And this is in the short term. Please note that adding Torvaptan will not improve the natural history of the disease. It will just give you some tolerance or improvement for, with the diuretic therapy. And uh, in grade two and three ascites, definitely you have to start them on a higher dose of diuretics. So it has to be concomitantly uh, torsamide or frusamide along with uh, spironolactone, never spironolactone alone or never, uh, you know, frusamide or torsamide alone. And if there is a good response, continue with minimal uh, maintenance therapy. If there is no good response, then if the patient is symptomatic, please go parasynthesis, or you can actually add tolvaptan and C4 betterment of response. Now, even if after doing all of this, patient is not improving, and the patient develops complications because of the diuretics like hyponatremia, kidney injury, or encephalopathy, then you please stop uh, the diuretics and then put the patient on additional uh, treatment parameters, uh, treatment options like parasynthesis, use of vasoactive drugs, and also uh, evaluate them for tips or liver transplantation because uh, a recurrent or a refractory ascites is actually a very poor prognostic indicator of uh, long-term survival. So these patients need to be um, uh, ideally looked into early liver transplant programs. So once more, I'm going to uh, rush through this. This is basically what we discussed in the previous slide, but I want to add two new points here. So you can actually see there is this uh, thing called, there is a drug called potassium candrio, uh, candrinoate. So this is what this is what they use in Japan. So basically, this is, is very similar to uh, spironolactone. What they do is they add this also along with the diuretic therapy, and then they define patients with refractory ascites. So this is something that we don't do and we don't know about. But in Japan, they use potassium candrenoate therapy to assess for diuretic, uh, diuretic uh, tolerance and improvement. Uh, now, if none of that works, then the patient has refractory ascites. And if the patient is symptomatic, the safest and best way is to do a parasynthesis. You remove uh, less than five liters. It is fine. You don't have to give albumin. But if you remove more than five liters, then with each additional liter, you have to give eight grams of albumin infusion to correct for that, the removal of the fluid. So that is what we do in uh, refractory symptomatic uh, ascites. But there is something known as CART therapy. Please note, note this uh, therapy. This is known as CART. CART is cell-free concentrated ascites reinfusion therapy. So for what, what they do is that when they remove large amounts of ascites, they uh, through as, 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 aseptic procedures and through aphoresis, they actually remove all the cellular components and concentrate the ascites to having globulins and only uh, albumin. And then they reinfuse that into the patient. So this way, you can actually reduce the financial burden on in patients where there is insurance policies like in uh, like yeah, in India. And also, what you can do is yeah. 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 Uh, I would request everyone to just mute their mics. Whoever is uh, uh, you know all the audience except for Dr. Abby, everybody who is there, please please mute their mics. I'm sorry, Dr. Abby. Yes, yeah, I don't know problem. It happens with Zoom meetings. Yeah, so uh, I was saying that, you know, there is something known as CART uh, therapy for, uh, you know, severe ascites or refractory ascites where they reinfuse the ascetic fluid uh, after aphoresis and uh, only maintaining albumin and globulin fractions. Now, if that doesn't work out, then you have to either evaluate the patient for a TIPS procedure or a liver transplantation. So now uh, I would like to discuss on uh, the TIPS procedure. So please follow the arrows at the bottom. So in this area is where you look for tips. Uh, so we have to select the patients very carefully. So if the patient has refractory ascites or recurrent ascites, uh, if the patient is less than uh, 65 years of age and has very good liver functions, has a low male score, and uh, there is a normal echocardiography, no lung diseases, then this patient is actually good to go for tips. Uh, every patient, I mean, I don't think everybody does this, but I think you should do this in every patient that you assess for tips or transplantation. Please check for the uh, BNP levels, the NT pro BNP or a BNP level, please check for it. If the patient has a very high BNP level or a very high NT pro BNP level, then this means, and the patient is elderly, and this means that post tips, the chances of developing cardiac complications is very high. So these patients should be very carefully selected. And uh, it should be uh, a conversation between the physician and the family and the patient 
uh, notifying them that you know there is a chance for post tips complication and if they are only willing for that please go ahead otherwise don't and in patients who are very uh, elderly that is more than 70 they have a very high um, very high chance of developing cardio i mean cardiac complications for example they have underlying cardiomyopathy their child score is more than 13 their mel score is more than 19 and their pro bnp levels are very high then these patients actually need to be evaluated for transplantation you know there is no role of tips here but there is some emerging data that in patients who have ckd which is why i have not mentioned ckd here in patients who have ckd and refractory ascites because of uh, cirrhosis they can be taken up for tips procedure even if they have ckd and on dialysis that actually improves the ascites so please remember CKD with refractory ascites and a stable liver function without encephalopathy active at admission uh, is actually a good indication to go ahead with TIPS procedure. Uh, apart from the fact that if the patient has underlying cardiac disease, is very elderly, frail, with high child scores and active encephalopathy, please don't. But otherwise, uh, TIPS can still be done in patients with CKD. Now, if the patient is uh, no, is, is a, a patient is actually a good candidate for transplantation, but they cannot afford or they cannot go for a transplantation early on, or if they are not good candidates for transplantation, then we have something known as alpha pump. So alpha pump is what we uh, we we fix a machine at the subcutaneous level and then insert two pumps into one into the aseptic fluid and one into the urinary bladder, and the pump actually keeps on pumping out the aseptic fluid through the urine. So alpha pump has been used in malignant ascites, but now latest studies have shown that alpha pump is useful in patients with refractory ascites uh, with underlying cirrhosis. The problem is that alpha pump cannot be used in advanced liver failure patients, that is patients with uh, recurrent sepsis or active sepsis, patients with encephalopathy active, patients with cardiac diseases, patients who are very elderly and frail. These patients will not improve with alpha pump. So please be careful in choosing your patients for alpha pump. I'm not sure if there is any alpha pump uh, being done in India because in our centers, we don't do it. So this is alpha pump where you place the machine here and then uh, you know, surgically place the uh, in, uh, inflow and outflow units and then the, uh, it pumps out through the urine. Now we come to a difficult but important aspect of portal hypertension, which is kidney injury. So to simplify the kidney injury aspect in cirrhosis due to portal hypertension, we have three scenarios. So in the first scenario, the patient is stable. The compensated cirrhosis patient, no ascites. You can actually see that the interlobular resistive index and the cortical resistive index, that is based on the flow, the renal blood flow, that is the renal arterial blood flow, the interlobular and cortical resistive index, if it is equal to the resist total resistive index, that is the total resistive index is actually normal in the absence of ascites, they have good renal function. But if the resistive index uh, actually starts increasing a bit, I mean, de decreasing a bit, that is the interlobular resistive index actually uh, reduces then the patients develop ascites. And then this is initially diuretic, uh, diuretic sensitive. But as the resistive index gap reduces drastically, then the diuretic refractory ascites develop. And these are the patients who develop kidney injury. That is, they can have HRS AKI or HRS AKD or HRS CKD. So this is the basic pathophysiology because of renal vasoconstriction that progresses from the hilum towards the cortex. And once patients have severe cortical hypertension and very low resistive index gap, that is when patients develop refractoriness to their ascites and kidney injuries. So now we have new terms. We don't call it HRS1 and 2 anymore. We call HRS1 as HRS AKI and we call HRS2 as HRS NACI, that is non-AKI. And HRS non-AKI is of two, that is HRS AKD and HRS CKD. So HRS AKI is when you have an increase in serum creatinine more than or equal to 0.3 milligram per deciliter within 48 hours. That is, if you have a baseline value. If you don't have a baseline value, then you look at some value available within the three months. And if there is a 50% increment in that particular value that you have within three months, then that is known as kid, acute kidney injury. And there, it should not correct with volume expansion. There should not be any shock or a recent diuretic or an NSAID use. And you should not have any proteinuria or hematuria, and the structural kidney should be normal. So that is AKI. Now come to AKD. In AKD, uh, the increase in serum creatinine is within the th last three months less than 50%. So if it is more than 50%, it is AKI. If it is less than 50% increment in three months, it is uh, HRS AKD. Also, additionally, you please look at this. The EGFR, this has to be calculated. Otherwise, you cannot uh, define this. This has to be calculated. EGFR should be less than 60 and without any other kidney uh, diseases. 
But if the patient has CKD, then the only parameter that you need to look into is the EGFR. So if the EGFR is less than 60 and the patient has a high creatinine level based on values available in the last three months, and the patient has no other cause of kidney disease and has cirrhosis and ascites, then that is HRS CKD. That is persistent elevation creatinine followed by decrement in renal perfusion and also glomerular filtration rate. So this is the new terms, please remember. So how do you approach? So first you define if the patient has AKI or AKD or CKD. So if the patient has AKI, uh, depending, on, uh, depending on the definition criteria, then you look at uh, responsiveness. Uh, then you look at uh, staging. So the AKI is staged as stage one, stage two, or stage three, depending on the increase in the creatinine from baseline. So you look at the increase in creatinine from the baseline, and uh, if the patient has increased uh, that is more than threefold from the baseline, then that is stage three. Now next is to uh, start treatment. So what we do is we stop diuretics, stop all the vasodilators, stop the nephrotoxic drugs. You treat any associated problems like diarrhea, infection, dehydration, GI bleeding. And what you do is you infuse albumin. Now, if the albumin infusion reverses the AKI, that is known as pre-renal AKI. It is not HRS AKI. So if it does not uh, improve the AKI or the AKI progresses, then it is HRS. So in HRS, you have to start the patient on either teleprocin with albumin or octreotide bidrotrin combination or noradrenaline and albumin combination, depending on uh, what is available at your center and what the patient can tolerate. And once you start this, you look for no response, partial response or complete response, depending on the creatinine values uh, at the baseline and at the start of therapy. So if the patient has very good response or complete response, then you treat the patient, uh, complete the course of the patient and then discharge him and then evaluate for liver transplantation. Now, if the response is partial or null, then please remember to find to reevaluate this patient for HRS AKD or CKD and also evaluate for other causes of kidney problems. For example, intrarenal and post-renal AKI. This is very important. So patients can actually have kidney injury at admission, but they can progress rapidly into AKD and CKD. You don't have to follow that six month uh, definition anymore. And if and this is a very important paper that actually came from ILBS where they showed that about 25% to 33% of patients with kid, acute kidney injury at admission, if you follow them up in three to six months, they actually start developing AKD and behave like CKD patients. So this is very important. So that is all with AKI. Please remember terlipresin, albumin, uh, or midodrin octreotide, or you can use even noradrenaline albumin, but always treat underlying causes. Always treat underlying causes and always stop the precipitating factors. That is what I have shown here. Please remember this. Next comes uh, hepatic encephalopathy. So uh, this, I think, is one of the toughest things that, I mean, very commonly identified, but one of the toughest also to manage. So hepatic encephalopathy is not just patient going into uh, altered behavior or a coma because of high ammonia. It is much more than that. So when you have a patient of liver failure, uh, because of the hepatocyte liver dysfunction, uh, in the presence or absence of autosystemic shunting, malnutrition, very low muscle level, that is very, uh, that is sarcopenia, frailty, that is very low muscle mass, and electrolyte imbalances like hyponatremia or hyperkalemia or hypokalemia or renal failure, uh, some events like GI bleeding and infection, certain drugs like benzodiazepines and opioids, and also um, uh, microbiota translocation. And, and this, I think we will not discuss much on that now because it's still experimental. But they've shown that, you know, uh, when patients have repeated infections and there is multidrug resistance, the change in the microbiota in the intestine actually promotes more of uh, HE episodes. But please remember that by looking at a patient of encephalopathy, it is not just reducing the ammonia. It is also looking at what precipitated the encephalopathy. So you have to correct for all of this. So if, the, if there is a benzodiazepine or opioid use, you have to stop that and ask not to take it anymore. Uh, GI bleed, control the bleed, infection, use antibiotics, correct electrolytes, and also improve the nutrition. Uh, previously, you said don't give high-protein diet uh, in a cirrhotic patient who has encephalopathy. That is all gone now. Continue high protein diet, at least minimum what they require they should get. High protein diet actually improves the sarcopenia or the muscle mass, thereby reducing in incidence of hepatic encephalopathy in the future. So please give high protein diet. And if the patient has a large potosystemic shunt, we can actually block it and then improve uh, uh, encephalopathy in this patient. And obviously, if the patient is in liver failure, he needs a liver transplant. And that is the only way to go for the future if patient's having encephalopathy. Now, in step one is to assess the patient for severity of the liver disease. 
rule out other causes of brain disease. For example, patient might be actively consuming alcohol. He has a psychiatric disease. There is a drug overdose. So rule out all those other causes and then come to a conclusion that yes, this is encephalopathy precipitated by this particular event. So you treat encephalopathy using uh, anti-ammonia measures and also treat the precipitating cause so, and uh, consider counseling for the precipitating cause so that it doesn't happen in the future. Now, how do you treat? There are a lot of options. So in acute hepatic encephalopathy, overt encephalopathy, you actually give the patient lactose. So you give lactose so that the patient purges at least two to three times a day and the patient wakes up. Uh, you add rifaximin if the patient is not improving. And also you can actually add LOLA. That is L-ornithin, L-aspartate or ornithin phenyl acetate. This is LOPA. Ornithin phenyl acetate is currently under trials. And I think the first uh, trial actually showed a negative outcome. But LOLA has very good evidence that it will improve encephalopathy in patients with acute overt encephalopathy. This is this data is from India by Professor Sandeep Sidhu in uh, Ludhiana where he showed that addition of uh, infusion of LOLA in patients with acute overt encephalopathy with standard of care for about five days, uh, that is 30 grams per day over 18 to 24 hours actually improves uh, recovery and causes early recovery. It does not affect the survival though. And then what you do is uh, if patients are still having a severe hepatic encephalopathy in hospital, there are other uh, measures like addition of albumin. Uh, giving glutamine synthetase replacement. These are all experimental. We don't do it in routine practice. Or you can actually give an extracorporeal albumin dialysis to reduce the ammonia burden and thereby improving the encephalopathy. But these are all expensive. Uh, most of the patients will improve with uh, correction of precipitating factors, correction of sepsis, the slight lemia collection, correction, and also use of rifaximin and lactulose. Now, always uh, remember to correct for the muscle mass. Look for frailty, look for sarcopenia. Correct that with nutritional supplementation and also add branch chain amino acids. This is very important. You add a branch chain amino acid rich snack in the night that greatly improves patient's outcome in cirrhosis with respect to hepatic encephalopathy. So advanced encephalopathy, that is grade three or four, you have to admit to the ICU. And most of these patients may require intubation if they are going into hepatic coma. So that you have to take care of and also look at all the precipitating factors and treat. And once the patient is fully evaluated and you don't see any precipitating factors, you know, you don't see any dyslectolemia, you just see very high ammonia, but no infection, no uh, hypokalemia, no hyponatremia, nothing, no bleeds, but the patient is in deep hepatic coma. Always uh, remember to look at large portosystemic shunts. And if you have large portosystemic shunts, always consider embolizing the portosystemic shunts because studies have shown that Closure of large portosystemic shunts improve patients' encephalopathy recurrence, I mean, reduce the recurrence, and also improve clinical outcomes. So this is an example from our unit where we actually diagnosed patients with severe recurrent hepatic encephalopathy or persistent hepatic encephalopathy of having underlying large portosystemic shunts. So we either use a balloon to occlude it, which is no more done now because balloon takes a lot of time. You have to inject sclerosin and wait, and it should be in the cath lab for about six to eight hours, which is too tedious. What we do now is to either put coils or use a plug. That is what is shown here. Yeah. This is the plug here, and this is the coil. So putting coils and putting plugs, actually the procedure gets over fast. You can have complete shunt occlusion, and the patients can be discharged much earlier for hepatic encephalopathy. Now comes hepatic hydrothorax. I think... Uh, it's easier to uh, treat ascites than it is easier to treat a hydrothorax, even though both are the same. I mean, they both are the same complications of the same event. But in hydrothorax, you have to uh, a small note on how it develops. So you have uh, ascites going directly to the hepatic, uh, I mean, to, to the uh, pleural space because of formation of certain defects or blebs in the diaphragmatic region. So that is what this classification shows, which I've done, shown below. That is type 1, there is no visible defect. To type 4, there is multiple fenestrations in the diaphragm. And the fluid in the, in the abdomen will go up because of a difference in transthoracic pressure gradient. Also, uh, severe ascygus vein hypertension. So this is something new. Severe has ascygus vein hypertension due to either portosystemic shunting or due to some shunting within the lung, that is intrapulmonary shunting, can actually lead to increase in uh, hepatic hydrothorax. So this is another pathogenesis that we identify uh, as part of uh, you know, hepatic hydrothorax formation. That is not just the ascites traveling up, it is actually related to portal hypertension within the lung and presence of portosystemic shunts also. So how do you manage? You manage it the same way you manage ascites. Only thing is that uh, hepatic hydrothorax actually has a poorer prognosis than uh, ascites when it becomes refractory. 
So these patients should be ideally evaluated for TRIPS or transplantation much earlier. And if they are not good candidates for liver transplantation or TRIPS, then the only option is to repeatedly do thoracosynthesis. You can actually do um, uh, you can actually do pleurodesis, or you can actually put in a, a chest tube, which is actually not recommended. Put in a chest tube for symptom relief in patients with rapid collection of hepatic hydrothorax. But the problem is that you consider the chest tube drainage only in patients who you think are not going to make it more than six months. So they have a very short-term survival and they're on extreme pain and palliative care. These patients for improving quality of life and improving uh, their symptoms, you put in a drain. Not every patient with a chest, uh, with a hydrothorax, which is recurrent or refractory requires a drain. Only those where you consider them as having very short survival, please do it. Otherwise, use of, hepat uh, use of, hepatic, uh, use of chest drains in hepatic hydrothorax has only led to more death. So that is, that is published in 1980s, where you can actually see that if the patient has rapidly collecting hydrothorax, if the patient is a transplant candidate or a TIPS candidate, please do that. Don't put a drain. Only for immediate symptomatic relief can you put a drain, but please remove it as early as possible. Do not keep it. Now comes uh, two other uh, rare but important complications, that is uh, hepatopulmonary syndrome and autopulmonary hypertension. So let us look at hepatopulmonary syndrome first. So this is the uh, pathogenesis of both. Uh, please don't mind all the molecular stuff that is in the in this image. This is for, uh, I think, students who are writing theory exams, they have to draw this. Otherwise, for us, it's not required. But please know this, that hepatopulmonary syndrome and portopulmonary hypertension, even though the uh, initiating events are all the same, the outcome, that is the main pathological event, is very different. So you look at hepatopulmonary syndrome, patients can actually have something known as uh, IPVD. So IPVD is intrapulmonary uh, vascular dilatations. So presence of intrapulmonary vascular dilatations is very common in cirrhosis patients. It does not mean that they have HPS. So for them to have HPS, they should have clinical features of HPS and investigational features of HPS. So just because you do a silent contrast study or an angiographic study and you find intrapulmonary vascular dilatations, that does not mean there is HPS. Please look at the criteria, which I'm showing you in the next slide, and then uh, diagnose the patient as HPS. So in a patient of HPS, there is a VQ mismatch. Uh, there is the right to left shunting. And there is decreased diffusion capacity, which can all be identified on the ABG. So you have to do an ABG and then look at clinical presence of clubbing or not. And if the ABG and the clinical manifestations uh, are, uh, you know, uh, suggestive, only then you say there is hepatopulmonary syndrome, not otherwise. Now look at portopulmonary hypertension. Everything else is the same, but except in these patients, they have extensive vasoconstriction. There is thrombus formation and plated aggregation within the lung microenvironment. So that is what that is that leads to vascular remodeling, right heart strain, and that is how these patients develop portopulmonary hypertension. So in portopulmonary hypertension, to identify these patients actually require cardiac catheterization. Without a cardiac catheterization, you cannot uh, diagnose portopulmonary hypertension, and this is very important. Just by doing an echo, you cannot diagnose. So let us go to hepatopulmonary syndrome. In hepatopulmonary syndrome. Uh, this is the latest easel guideline where they actually say that if the patient has tachypnea or polypnea or clubbing or cyanosis, uh, then HPA should be suspected. The next step is actually to do an ABG. So the ABG should be done in an upright position on room air. So you don't need to do an ABG lying down, getting up, sitting up, nothing like that. Just do an ABG in upright position on room air. And for patients with uh, uh, you know the saturation, oxygen saturation less than 96%, uh, that is on pulse oximetry. Uh, the ABG is the next step. So somebody has clinical features of uh, tachypnea, clubbing, etc. You do a uh, SpO2, that is do a pulse oximetry. The pulse oximetry shows uh, SpO2 less than 96. Next step is to do ABG, sitting position, ambient, um, ambient uh, room air. And if the ABG actually shows that uh, the PaO2 is lower than 80, and the uh, PA, that is the uh, alveolar arterial oxidation gradient, that is PAO2 is more than equal to 15 while breathing ambient air. This means that there is uh, hepatopulmonary syndrome. In adults, more than 65 years of age, this PAO2 gradient should be, cutoff should be 20, not 15. So less than 65, it is 15. More than 20, uh, 65 years, it is 20. So once this is uh, done, you can say that, you know, this patient may have HPS. Now next is to do a microbubble study. So you use a saline contrast echo. And in saline contrast echo, you actually show that in the absence of intracardiac shunting, there is presence of intrapulmonary vascular dilatations and intrapulmonary shunting. That is, then you can actually say that there is uh, HPS. 
So what about a, 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 a mass scan that is a, a, a tagged uh, scan? This is only complementary. This, this shows the extent or the severity of the shunting. It does not actually confirm the shunting or type of shunting. It can even be intracardiac shunting. So the main, main aspects is to look at the ABG, look at clinically, look at the pulse oximeter, look at the ABG, and then do a saline contrast echo to identify intrapulmonary shunting and also uh, absence of extra cardiac shunting. So based on the PIO2 cutoffs, you can actually uh, diagnose this patient as mild, moderate, or severe, or very severe hepatopulmonary syndrome. And depending on that, you treat. So most important is long-term oxygen therapy. This is the only therapy that has shown, non-surgical therapy that has shown some benefit. There is no effective pharmacotherapy. There is no recommendation for tips in these patients because uh, in severe and moderate, uh, in severe and very severe HPS, tips will actually not improve these patients. And also in patients with very severe hypoxemia, that is their PAO2 gradient is less than 40, 45 to 50. Then they also have very poor outcomes after transplant. So please remember that when you assess for uh, liver transplantation, if the patient has HPS, if the patient has very severe HPS, either take in corrective measures and then uh, look, at, look to transplant the patients with a lower risk level. Or if the patient is waiting for a transplant and has mild to moderate HPS, please remember to repeat the ABG every six months to see if the HPS is becoming severe and very severe. If it is not, then the patients are good to go for transplant. If the severity is increasing, then consider uh, patients on to be on supportive care only because transplantation outcomes are not that good in patients with severe HPS. Now coming to portopulmonary hypertension. So in portopulmonary hypertension, if the patient has dyspnea or uh, exercise intolerance, etc., if you rule out other causes of uh, heart diseases, uh, do a, a, a thoracic echography, uh, echocardiography, and you find features of pulmonary arterial hypertension, then the next step is to go for a right heart catheterization. So you have to do an angi angiographic assessment. So based on right heart catheterization, these three parameters, that is the mean pulmonary arterial pressure, the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, pulmonary vascular resistance, and the cardiac index. Based on these four parameters, you define the patients as having a high state output, a volume overload, or if the patient has a volume overload against vis-a-vis -vis pulmonary arterial hypertension, that is portopulmonary hypertension, uh, or the patient has purely portopulmonary hypertension. So based on these parameters and their increment, decrement, you know, uh, e equality, you define these patients actually having uh, other causes of pulmonary hypertension rather, rather than portopulmonary hypertension. So the patient has portal hypertension, features of portal hypertension, and the last column here, and this last column is present, then you say that the patient has portopulmonary hypertension. That is mean arterial pressure more than 25, uh, capillary wedge pressure is less than 15, and the pulmonary vascular resistance is more than 240 times. So this should be calculated. And once the patient is having uh, confirmed portopulmonary hypertension, then you look at the severity based on the mean pulmonary arterial pressure, that is MPAP. <clears throat> so the MPAP is less than 35, uh, more than 35, less than 45, or more than 45. Depending on that, there is mild, moderate, and severe portopulmonary hypertension. Severe portopulmonary hypertension patients cannot be transplanted because they have very high chances of intracardiac, uh, intra-op events and immediate post-op events in the form of cardiac arrest and infections and a lot of other problems. So please monitor those patients and give them supportive care. So to summarize, uh, in uh, hepatopulmonary syndrome, uh, you have a lot of options, but only supplemental oxygen is the best non-surgical option. In those patients with mild to moderate HPS, transplantation is the best option. There are a lot of other <clears throat> uh, options available. For example, if you have uh, patients with uh, severe HPS not responding to oxygen therapy and are not good candidates for transplantation, please assess for angiographic evidence of intrapulmonary shunting or large portosystemic shunts and, uh, and uh, you know, occluding the portosystemic shunts or embolizing the uh, intrapulmonary shunts actually improve the patient's oxygenation. So these are also options for HPS, but otherwise, a uh, lot of medical options that we use in our day-to-day -day practice is not useful. I think a lot of patients are on garlic extracts. Garlic extracts improves oxygenation, but it's only for short term and it's only very anecdotal studies. The problem is that if you give garlic for a longer duration, patients have the risk of developing drug-induced liver injury. So garlic is a herb which can actually promote drug-induced liver injury. So please be careful in using this uh, in your patients for longer duration. Studies on rifaximin, norfloxacin, all available in the literature, but none of them actually shows good out long-term outcomes. When it comes to portopulmonary hypertension, again, tips is contraindicated in moderate to severe. 
there is no benefit of anticoagulation or calcium channel blockers. Uh, in patients who have very severe portopulmonary hypertension, please stop beta blockers and you know continue with banding ligation for varices because beta blockers actually worsen uh, in the severe group uh, clinical events in patients with por severe portopulmonary hypertension. A lot of other options like bosentan, endothelial receptor antagonists, phosphodiesterase for individuals. These are all available in the in the you know it's all in the literature, but uh, there are no recommendations to using it. You may use it or not use it. Not using it will not actually change anything. May using it may actually improve, but does not sustain, and it, it can actually also lead to some adverse event because of the unnecessary use of drugs. So please remember that. So finally, uh, when you look at patients with portal hypertension and cirrhosis, do not aim to cure it. You know we have to also aim to. Uh, you should also aim to care, you know, treat to care. So a lot of patients that you see, I'm sure that everybody will not go for a transplant. It's not easy. So those patients who have uh, no options for a transplant, who are poor candidates for transplant, please look at specialized treatments like shunt embolization, TIPS, uh, uh, albumin dialysis, or, uh, you know, uh, uh, specific uh, procedures which can actually improve uh, their clinical outcomes and not improve their overall picture. So you can actually go for these specialized treatments targeting portal hypertension to improve the quality of life of these patients, even though you may not actually give them a long life. So please remember, all the things that we discussed are not only just for treatments, these are also for palliation. And with this, I end my uh, talk for the day. Uh, thank you very much for your patient listening. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Abhi, uh, it was a wonderful presentation. I mean, I have been practicing. Uh, I'm, I'm a liver transplant surgeon, so obviously there were so many, so many points that you know I was like, okay, so this patient is was not supposed to come to a liver transplant surgeon at all. So, but yeah, I, I got to know, I got to learn a lot, uh, and uh, it was a very, very crisp and very, very well made presentation. So really, thank you. And uh, before we go on to, to the discussion, we have uh, our panelists. So um, I, I, you know, before we go to the to the, to the, the panelists, I would just ask Dr. Saiska Amin. She is the pediatric pathologist. She wanted to discuss, a, you know, to have a small presentation on the on the pediatric aspect of the portal hypertension. So once she finishes, then we'll be discussing the other interventions by the interventional radiologist and the hepatologist. Dr. Saiska. Uh, hi, good morning. Are you able to see my screen and hear me? Yes, 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 yes. Can you can you please make it full screen? Or... Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, is it full screen now? I can't, I can't make out. Um, I'll start. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Philip. That was an uh, amazing presentation with so much information. Um, as we all know that all our pediatric data uh, is extrapolated so from sorry. the adult data. Yeah. I'm so sorry, Dr. Sista. Uh, your screen, I, I think you are, you are, you're sharing the non, you're sharing the wrong screen. You, are, you have to reshare the one which is uh, the full screen version. Uh, Okay, uh, can we share it now?
please share the screen. I, I, we are not able to see the screen right now. It's not shared. Okay, is it better? Yes, yes, yes. Oh. Perfect. Um, sorry for this. Um, so as I was mentioning that most of the pediatric data is extrapolated from the adult data, uh, given the minimum number of uh, randomized studies that we have. So I'll very quickly rush through because of lack of time. Um, I think the definition for portal hypertension is similar between the adult and uh, the pediatric population. We generally go with the pressure gradient of more than five centimeters of water between the hepatic veins and portal circulation. What are the causes of portal hypertension in children? Um, so we divide the causes as prehepatic, uh, hepatic and post-hepatic causes. In prehepatic causes, we talk about certain conditions like portal vein thrombosis, which is the most common cause of portal hypertension in children. Uh, besides this, in hepatic, we have anything to do with cirrhotic and non-cirrhotic liver diseases. Most common in cirrhotic being biliary atresia, which is the number one cause of cirrhotic liver disease in children. Post-hepatic, we have venal Venoclusive disease or butt carry syndrome, which can present with portal hypertension. Um, certain recommendations, which are a little different from uh, uh, adult recommendations, um, uh, basically try to keep the hemoglobin a concentration between seven to eight for pediatric population in children with portal hypertension. Um, the drugs that have been tried in children uh, for uh, prophylaxis. Uh, um, octreotide is something which is commonly used during the acute uh, bleeding episode. And later for prophylaxis, we recommend the child to be on propranolol. Antibiotics, there is no data to show that you need to give antibiotics immediately. Um, however, if there is a suspicion of uh, a sepsis, early antibiotics should be used in these children. Endoscopy in adults generally is said, as Dr. already mentioned, that it's within 12 hours. So pediatric population, once we have a stabilization of the patient and um, try to do it within 24 hours of presentation. In the uh, children, there's minimal data to suggest uh, 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 interventions like tip surgery. However, uh, uh, once the child is stabilized, endoscopy and repeat endoscopy with scleroabanding banding has been tried for children. Um, as doctor mentioned about the balloon tamponade, again in adults, in children it's very rarely used unless the child is continuously bleeding and we do not have any other expertise in the unit to help us control the bleed, then the um, SB or balloon tamponade is used for these children. So as doctor mentioned about uh, diagnosis, I'll quickly say fibroscan in pediatric population is still not uh, recommended because of the um, lack of expertise and the inter-observer variation which we see in the findings. Um, a pressure gradient to measure again in children is very difficult, so we do not do that. Um, coming to bottle hypertension management, uh, so if a child who's come to you um, and clinically there is a suspicion of bottle hypertension, um, which we come to know an examination with a cirrhotic liver and a huge spleen, uh, we send these children for non-invasive investigations, which includes ultrasound of the abdomen to look at the echo texture of the liver, to look at the portal pressures and to look at the spleen. Uh, on lab parameters, we look at the hemoglobin, we look at the WBC count and we look at low platelet count. And if there's an underlying cirrhotic disease, most commonly biliary atresia, we know that they land up with complications of portal hypertension. If they are asymptomatic, we keep them under regular monitoring. We see them in clinics almost every three to six months and monitor them with ultrasound, clinical examination and lab parameters. However, if the child is showing worsening liver disease or worsening parameters, they should be taken up for a surveillance endoscopy. The upper GI endoscopy is offered to these patients and then they are monitored for progression. So depending on what you find in an asymptomatic child, if endoscopy is not showing any viruses or low risk, then we do not do any intervention. We monitor the child every uh, six months to one year, depending on the first endoscopy. However, if there is high risk viruses, then the treatment is offered to the child um, to eradicate these viruses and beta blockers uh, have been uh, started. So propranolol is the drug of choice for children, one milligram per kilogram per day in two divided doses. If a child is presented to you first time with a upper GI bleed, 
immediate resuscitation and emergency management is to be done. And that is uh, to start pharmacological therapy. We start octreotide in these children, a bolus dose followed by a maintenance uh, continuous infusion for these children at one to two mics per kg per hour, which helps in controlling the bleed. Once the child is stable, we take them for endoscopy. And depending on the findings, the child is either undergone uh, endoscopic uh, serotherapy or a banding. And then the repeat, uh, uh, um, the endoscopies, as we say, has to be done every uh, six months if it is a grade two and every three months if it's a grade three. So we still follow this uh, uh, kind of classification where we say grade one, grade two and grade three, wherein the grade one is minimal uh, elevation above the surface and no active intervention is needed, just monitoring. Grade two is where you have tortuous, uh, tortuous veins seen, which are occupying less than one third of the lumen. And grade three are larger, which occupy more than one third of the lumen. Uh, benefits of sclero versus uh, band ligation. Uh, band ligation is always preferred over uh, sclerotherapy because of the lower uh, risk which is involved during the procedure and the fewer sessions with the child would need in future. And the recurrence of uh, viruses is the only thing which is higher in a band ligation compared to sclerotherapy. Um, expertise is required with band ligation if the uh, if the uh, endoscopist is not confident of doing a band uh, given the size of the child then sclerotherapy would be recommended so this is some pictures to show as doctors already shown us earlier uh, the band ligation how it is done with the um, endoscope and then the varix is sucked into the uh, band ligator and the band is inserted we generally uh, allow three to four bands at a time we do not uh, need to increase the number of bands uh, as for sclerotherapy, on the other diagram, you can see the needle and where the sclerosin agent is used. Uh, so normally we use in our, use in our center ETO. Um, it is uh, generally 1 ml uh, in each uh, varix, maximum of 2 to 3 ml is used. And we do not try to do more than 3 uh, varix uh, injections uh, during one uh, session. Uh, tips, as doctor mentioned, what it is to do basically to decrease the portal uh, pressures and decompress the system. Uh, a stent is placed through the IJV into the right hepatic vein and right branch of portal vein. Again, this is recommended in children who have uh, refractory bleeding where you're not able to control the bleed. Refractory ascites, we have children with Bacchiari syndrome who benefit with this procedure. However, uh, expertise is required and uh, not everyone is able to do these procedures in small size of children. Uh, I'm just going to very briefly mention about some shunt surgeries which are uh, being done for extra hepatic portal vein obstruction, uh, which is basically recommended in children to decompress the system and give them a better outcome. So mesorex shunt is one of them where you have the superior mesenteric with the, uh, the left mesenteric with the left portal vein, wherein there's decompression of the portal pressures while we are maintaining the circulation in the portal system as well as the mesenteric system. And this is another physiologic shunt which is created, a distal splenorenal shunt, which is again recommended in children, which is safe and has good outcome in children. Uh, liver transplantation uh, is uh, uh, increasing uh, in numbers now, given our children who are being identified with cirrhotic liver disease, portal hypertension complications. Um, these children who have refractory bleeding, refractory ascites, not responding to treatment, come in with hepatic encephalopathy and other syndromes which doctor already mentioned, hepatopulmonary and portopulmonary syndrome. Now, hepatopulmonary syndrome for us uh, is a known complication in long-standing cirrhotic liver disease, children with biliary atresia, who've had their first surgery as Kasai and are doing well over the years in the second decade, they may come in with presentation of hepatopulmonary syndrome. Um, these children are diagnosed basically on clinical parameters of hypoxemia as on blood gas will be documented. And then they have uh, um, echocardiography, a bubble echocardiography to confirm the findings. Um, these children do well with a liver transplant. Once the pressure is and the cirrhotic liver is replaced with a normal healthy liver, the child improves significantly within a few weeks and does not require any more oxygen to maintain the saturations. Um, certain take on points for pediatric um, cases would be uh, varicel bleed is most common presentation of portal hypertension in children. Emergency management of upper GI bleed is uh, very critical. Uh, we need to keep these children in surveillance endoscopy program depending on the first finding so that we can prevent the recurrence of bleed. So if your uh, a child is having just grade uh, one and is doing well in the follow-up visits, you do not need to scope them immediately. You, you schedule them for a one-year surveillance endoscopy program. Uh, for children who are grade two, grade three, they will be seen earlier, three to six months for endoscopies. 
Uh, these shunt procedures uh, uh, basically are for children with extra hepatic portal vein obstruction who benefit with these procedures and liver transplant should be offered for refractory cases. Uh, thank you. That would be from me. Uh, thank you, Dr. Saista. It was a wonderful presentation. Uh, so uh, I'll just invite Dr. Amar. Uh, uh, Dr. Amar, would you like to discuss uh, something about intermission ideology? Yeah, Dr. Saurabh. So in, uh, although Dr. Abe has given a very good uh, overview and uh, he has talked a lot about the interventions to be done. So just to make his points clearer, I can just go through some of the cases, what he has discussed, like how do we do and how actually it helps. So uh, I'll share my screen. Uh, I think ma'am has to remove her screen, screen then only I can start sharing. Yeah. So hope uh, now the screen is visible to all of us. Yes, sir, it is. Yeah, perfect. So I'll be talking about tips, parto, and some of the shunt occlusions, which uh, Dr. Abbey has nicely told like how to do and what to do. So first case would be a 40, 48 year old male, alcohol related CLD presented with uncontrolled varicel bleed and it is GOV2. So just to make uh, sure that GOV2 is the most notorious, like uh, I, we know that esophageal viruses are very high pressure viruses and uh, endoscopy if failed, then TIPS nicely takes care of it. But GOV2 may or may not be associated with a shunt. And sometimes even if it is associated with a shunt, it is a high pressure system. Whereas if we talk about isolated gastric viruses, then IGV1 is actually associated with a shunt and mostly it is a low pressure system. So treating a low pressure system is a entirely a different ball game than treating a high pressure system. So GOV2 is actually, it lies in between where you don't know whether to go in for a TIPS or you should do a uh, BRTO or PARTO procedure that is retrograde occlusion and obturation and obliteration of the varices. So this patient had a HVPG of 26. So a very high HVPG, GOV2, and uh, as uh, Dr. Abbey told that any uh, patient with a HVPG of more than 20 uh, has a very poor prognosis. So this is the first image after getting into the portal vein. So as soon as we get into the portal vein, if you see, this is how it's so much talked about tips. Now, how do we do? So this is the cannula, which is into the hepatic vein and we have punctured the portal vein. And I'll run this video again. So we are into the portal vein. The right branch is not seen. The left branch is barely seen. And what we see is large varix, large, large varix, which is draining. But the shunt is very thin in caliber. We can see the renal vein and we can even see the azygous system. If you see these parallel lines, these are the azygous system. And this is not the only one we can see. There are other shunts as well. So this is a difficult scenario. So we went into the shunt. We saw a very huge. So we started putting coil. We placed at least 10 coils. So 10 embolization coils were placed into it. And even after placing 10 embolization coil, this is how. So embolization coils actually do nothing in cirrhotic patients. So despite having a, a fibers which are thrombogenic, they don't incite thrombosis in cirrhotic patients as fast as we want them to do. So we injected glue into it. This is how glue is being injected, you can see. And then multiple such injections were done. And after that, this was occluded. So there is some flow. So now the picture is a somewhat different. So previously it was a completely hepatofugal flow. We have made it a bit hepatopetal, but still there are many more gastric viruses which are being feeded and the patient is actively bleeding. And we, if you see, you can see a sink taken tube over there, the big balloon lying over here. And despite this big balloon, the patient's bleed is uncontrolled. So what next? Going to the next viruses, again, closing it with glue. So the picture much better, but still there is something over here. We see something over here. So 
Then finally, we embolize this also. And this is the tips which has been placed. And uh, this is how a hepatofugal flow has been. So this, the system has nicely been decompressed. And uh, this patient, though, because of uh, you know the tips was planned a bit late and the patient was being hemodynamically managed. So we lost this patient, but had a survival. The, the patient never bled thereafter, but due to multiple, uh, multiple organ failure and uh, acute kidney injury, which actually complicated and further uh, ventilator acquired pneumonia. And there are so many things to happen in ICU. So we couldn't save, but there were no further bleeds uh, after embolizing. So we know that such patients are poor patients. So that's why the concept of preemptive tips is there. And definitely we need to look into preemptive tips and actually follow these patients. Otherwise, despite doing such a massive efforts, we may not be able to save the patient. So next patient is uh, case is uh, tips for portal vein thrombosis. Again, a very important uh, area which we need to see because initially portal vein thrombosis was a contraindication for tips. But uh, off late, we are using it to recanalize the portal vein and prevent the complications of uh, portal hypertension secondary to portal vein thrombosis. So this is a case of 56-year-old female, hepatitis B-related CLD, ascites for six months, had complete portal vein thrombosis and was on anticoagulation, but presented with Malina. And this is the CT, how it looked like. So the complete portal vein thrombosis, we can see this is the left gastric vein, which is ballooned out, dilated and the patient had a bleed, and this is how it looks. So portal vein is totally gone. This is here, the left gastric vein, which is dilated. So again, we started, we somehow punctured, though there are multiple ways, you know, which has been described in literature, how to tackle such kind of patients. And uh, in patients who are not decompensated, don't have ascites, transsplenic tips has also been described where you go through transsplenic uh, route into the splenic vein, get into the portal vein, and then again, you target, you place some object over there and you target it from the top, that is from the jugular root, from the hepatic vein, and then you do a tips. But here we were fortunate enough to do a tips through a routine uh, transjugular way. But what we saw, we saw is this is the same picture which we saw on the CT. So big varices. This is, uh, we are calibrating, we are taking the measurement where how long the stent has to be placed. And this is the final picture where we see a nice flow has been achieved. And this is uh, how the patient, patient did very well. There was no further episode of bleeding. And uh, this is a one year follow-up where we see the tips remains patent, no ascites, the liver bulk, which was uh, appearing much smaller before. So here we see the bulk is much small though I cannot say that whether the bulk has actually increased, but visually, yes, it appears it has increased. The system is appearing patent and we see no ascites over here. So portal vein thrombosis is uh, important area as far as uh, the surgeons are concerned who are doing transplants because uh, recanalizing a portal vein and getting a good portal vein, vein for uh, anastomosis is always a better idea than using uh, multiple grafts and making a complex surgery if that can be done. So this is one of the area where we can help uh, the patient as well as the surgeons in case the patient needs a transplant at some later time. So PARTO is an extension of BRTO. So that is a obliteration of a shunt through a portosystemic communication. So here we were decompressing the system in tips. We were creating a shunt between the portal system and the systemic circulation. Whereas in PARTO, what we do, there is already a shunt form. So the nature has already formed a shunt to decompress a system, but that shunt is giving us trouble and that's why we need this procedure. So what is the trouble in this particular case? Here we can see this is a shunt. So not a big shunt, but the varix, the gastric varix is much big. So you can see there is a perforator, the small perforator, which is leading to this gastric mucosa bulge and a large varix, which is seen over here. And this was a pa patient who was glued multiple times and still continued to bleed and hence came to me for the, the part of procedure. So this is how we, we did the part of procedure. We go from the femoral vein into the renal vein, cannulate the shunt. And here the shunt has been cannulated. A plug has been played. And beyond the plug, you can see this is sclerosant is nicely filling. And this, you can see, this is the small perforator. This is the gastric area, which has been gastric varix, which has been filled with the sclerosing agent and which has nicely been obliterated. 
And this is the final picture. This is how it looks like finally. And this is the next day CT scan where you can see this is the plug which was placed and this is the cast of the lipidol and the sclerosing agent which has thrombosed the complete system and it is totally gone. So there are other areas like uh, what Dr. Abbey told, like uh, how to occlude shunt. So there are a different way. One of is transesplenic. Here you can see there is a large transesplenic shunt. There was not a big uh, linorenal shunt or a splenorenal shunt to be cannulated. The portal vein is very thin. If you see this portal vein, this is how. This is the artery and this is the portal vein. So almost of same size. The portal vein is very small. And what we see here, we did the... We punctured the splenic parenchyma, went into the splenic vein, and this is the shunt. So we placed a plug into it. And after putting a plug, again, it works like a sieve. It does not occlude the system. So some glue and some gel form has been used, which has occluded the sieve, that mesh of the plug. And then finally, this is the picture what we get. So totally occluded system. And this is how the thrombosis is seen. So this was the pre-procedure. This is the post-procedure shunt, which is totally occluded. And to, to the, you know, another thing what happens because it forces the blood to get into the portal vein, the portal vein diameter increases. This was the pre-procedure portal vein diameter. And this is the post-procedure for portal vein diameter. So you can see the thrombosis shunt and you can see the diameter of the portal vein. So though it comes with some complications like decompensation here, you can see some ascites but definitely there is a hepatopetal flow. And if we are able to manage this ascites and if the patient is not in an advanced liver disease, probably this will hold good. And in our uh, particular setup, we generally prefer to take patients of child B or uh, child C cirrhosis and generally try to avoid patients with child C for such kind of procedure because, because in those cases, it would be very difficult to manage ascites because it becomes refractory after embolization of the shunt. So, so shunt embolization and closure does help, but we have to choose our patients very carefully and Dr. Abby has nicely told like how to choose the patient. Similarly, there is another shunt paramblical vein and we can uh, do occlusion for paramblical vein. Sometimes these uh, profusely bleed. He has shown one of the cases how it, it bled and similar kind of case, we can see the paramblical vein, which is over there. And this is done through direct puncture. You can see we have punctured it directly, gone inside and then placed a plug and placed glue came out and this is the picture how it looks like. So this is the plug, this is occluded shut. So no paramblical vein thereafter. And this patient was uh, presented with encephalopathy, no encephalopathy, five years follow up, no decompensation. So many times if you choose the patient uh, uh, carefully, then probably you have a very good outcome. So the key is to catch these diseases early, treat them properly and choose your patient very carefully. Thank you so much. If there are any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer. Thank you, Dr. Amar. Uh, Hi, Dr. Amar. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. I, I just have a doubt to have an, uh, something that Dr. Amar said. So what is the experience of uh, your team in uh, portal vein thrombosis doing tips and then going on to a transplant? What have the surgeons told you regarding that with the tips shunt being inside the no, it's like uh, it is going to help because, uh, you know, the literature from US does tell that uh, those patients having chronic portal vein thrombosis uh, actually leads to a complicated uh, surgery and outcomes may be, you know, variable. But if you have a recanalized portal vein, which is a good lumen, so anastomosis becomes easier. So this is as per the literature. This is not a, from my personal experience. And uh, this is from, uh, I, I think, uh, uh, Riyadh Salim group from, uh, you, um, I think, uh, from Chicago. So th these are the papers from Riyadh Salim group. So those uh, these people are talking about such patients and probably they have a data of more than 100 patients where the patients, uh, almost 40 patients underwent transplant with a recanalized portal vein. As far as my experience is concerned, like my transplant surgeons normally do these kind of transplants. We're using different cryopreserved grafts or uh, different kind of grafts, which they already have. 
So in our center, I don't have any experience where we recanalized the portal vein and they did a transplant thereafter. But yes, there are literature supporting that particular concept. Thank you. I, I agree. I think if the if we can recanalize the portal vein, then probably it might be a good idea rather than go for complicated procedures. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Doctor Amrish. Uh, the mic is all yours, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Very nice and comprehensive presentations by Dr. Abhi, Dr. Amar, and Dr. Shrestha. And uh, here I would like to uh, point out a few more things. Actually, it's a revision of uh, Abhi's presentation. That uh, first and foremost, whenever a patient presents with acute variceal bleed, we should resuscitate. But here, resuscitation is with IV fluids and blood uh, PRBC, not with FFPs. FFPs uh, uh, will not correct the coagulopathy in cirrhotic patients. That one point I would like to highlight, and it can lead to uh, rather some complications due to transfusion. So it should be avoided in setting of variceal bleed until and unless a tag parameter or a rotum parameter is showing a diffuse coagulation dysfunction. Secondly, uh, to avoid the side effects of terlipressin, nowadays we are giving terlipressin in infusion form rather than in bolus forms. And that has been shown in few studies to be equally effective and with no major side effects. Thirdly, I would like to uh, point out that early or preemptive tips is very important modality in child B and A cirrhotics. Also upcoming in child C cirrhotics with the uh, CTP score of less than 14. Earlier, this was child C cirrhotic was considered as a contraindication for tips, but in acute worry cell B, child C cirrhotic patients, if there is no transplant option, should go for tips for better management. Fourthly, a newer modality has come up, but that is Denisella stent. Actually, I was about to show the video, but the time is not permitting. And we have uh, put many uh, Denisella uh, stents, and we have also put Denisella stent in a patient who was, uh, during the transplant workup, he had a major uh, variceal bleed. And in that situation, we did put a Denisella stent, and then this patient was taken up for uh, liver transplantation. Most transplantation, day five or six, we removed the stents. So it's a kind of bridge or a rescue therapy uh, and with equal, equally effective to sense taken uh, Blackmore tube, but no complications. And uh, another thing I would like to highlight is that uh, early, uh, introduction of beta blockers is helpful. In a predecy trial, which was done uh, in 2020, and after that, few meta uh, one meta-analysis recently published in Journal of Hepatology has shown that early introduction of beta blockers is helpful in preventing decompensation and improving survival in patient cirrhotic patients. And uh, Early introduction is in those patients you can give, you can make use of the fibro scan. And if the LSM is more than 25, you can safely introduce beta blockers. And in beta blockers, carbidolol is a drug of choice above propanolol because it has it improves intrahepatic resistance more effectively than propanolol. So these are few points which I wanted to highlight from recent Beveno guidelines and uh, the general practice uh, which we are doing. And uh, I congratulate uh, Abby and uh, Dr. Amar and Dr. Shesta for such a wonderful presentations. Thank you very much. And if there are a few questions, uh, we would like to take up. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Amrish. I must say that was a very extensive review of uh, portal hypertension by all the all the speakers and the panelists. May I just add that um, 
See, our aim should be to make sure the patient gets uh, customized care, which gives him the longest survival. So a patient at 19 or 20 mel who bleeds, uh, the primary question should be that he should not have reached an MELD of 19 or 20, should have been followed up well and probably offered the chance that a transplant could have been done when he is stable. And we are no longer in the 90s or the 80s. We have about uh, 90 to 95% survival when in transplant when the patients are selected well. But all these things that, uh, that has been told, the parto and all these things, I think they should be, uh, we should identify patients who will benefit them the most and uh, probably consider transplant when the patient deserves it. Well, I think it has been a wonderful session. I think everybody has benefited. Very good. I think we as a, we as a hepatology community in India is, I mean, going lead bounds. Um, we have a lot of expertise now. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. Unfortunately, because of some time constraints, we have to finish and uh, we could not get a lot of input from Dr. Ravi. But Dr. Ravi, our colleagues, fortunately, uh, joining us in the next session as well. Uh, so we have another session on how I do it, hernia, uh, next uh, Sunday, as well as uh, the second part of the portal hypertension, that is the non serotic aspect of the portal hypertension on 25th of September. The information of which will be sent on the uh, Google group through the email, as well as the WhatsApp groups. Um, uh, I request you all to join Tugs Global, uh, uh, you know, Tugs community at Tugs Global, www.tugsglobal.com. And uh, also follow the Tugs match we have, uh, at, uh, uh, you know, through our uh, uh, Twitter and other social media accounts. And uh, our Gmail, Gmail ID is, is uh, Tugs match at the rate of gmail.com. So if you have any questions, you are free to send us an email. Thank you all. Uh, for such a wonderful presentation today and the video of this session will be uploaded on the YouTube and will be shared very soon. And the certificates of the attendance will be sent to every uh, attendees from today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Saro. Thank you. And, and thank you, Tug. Thank you. Yeah. And Abby, it was a nice presentation. Thanks. Sir, thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Great. you so much. Thank you. Wonderful presentation. And, uh, and wonderful presentation from Dr. Saisa. Nice uh, update on the pediatric uh, portal application. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Got to learn a lot from you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. All right.